Good morning, and welcome to episode 22 of Talking to Artists, uh, a casual conversation with artists who understand the balance of creating something meaningful and beautiful while also understanding the business of art that's required to actually get those pieces out into the world. Um, this podcast is designed for other artists to learn tips and tricks, but also for collectors and art lovers to get a better understanding of the effort, inspiration, sweat, and hard work that kind of goes into actually creating for a living. So today, I'm really excited. We're going to be talking to Morgan Jones. He is a mixed media artist who kind of layers photography um, and with some really interesting messages, and he's going to tell you all about what he's doing. So I'm going to see if he is actually uh, joined, because we're... He has. Wow. That's very efficient and fast. <laughs> we'll wait for Morgan to join us. Hey. Hey. How are you? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm having coffee. This is coffee. <laughs> Instead of what is it? Comedians in cars. It's coffee with KT. Oh, that works. <laughs> I would love to. I love that one, though, with uh, in the cars where they just kind of like sing and chat. And it's, uh, well, yeah, it's a fun see. concept. I'll chat, but I don't think I'm going to sing to you, but I'll chat. I did get Sue McNanley to sing John Denley Denver last oh, weekend. Did you really? Last week. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice, nice, nice. It's one of, it was one of those songs that she had, she had on her website, and I'm like, I think we should sing it just for people that don't know it. <laughs> I don't uh, think she was too I'm happy with me. I'm not sure that I know it. Now I'm going to have to have a listen to it. Yeah, well, don't worry. I won't ask you to sing. Um, okay. But uh, anyway, welcome. I've got my water because my tea uh, got brewing for 15 minutes and now is gross. But, oh, um, my coffee. Okay. Anyway, yeah, so I'm really excited to talk to you because normally we see each other so often at different art fairs and we would yeah. be kind of preparing for one of a kind and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And of course, didn't get to do any of that this year. So no. maybe you can do a bit of an introduction about uh, kind of what you do. And uh, then I'd like to really talk about your inspiration, how your observances really kind of feed your work. Um, and also, I just love your concept of uh, trial and error being kind of a great teacher and Fact yeah. that sometimes when things screw up, you can get great stuff out of it. But anyway, first of all, why don't you start off by telling us who you are and maybe doing a little bit of a tour of your studio. Uh, well, uh, so my name's Morgan Jones. Um, I, a few years ago, turned my garage into a studio because I find that with what I do, um, it's a lot of layering. So, I don't know, it could be 10 o'clock at night and I have to put a coat of varnish on several pieces which is literally going to take me half an hour so to drive to a studio i used to be at walnut studios um for mm, a number of years right before but it burnt to, down before it burnt down yeah i wasn't there yeah. when it burnt down luckily oh. but um anyways so so the garage studio kind of became something of convenience temporarily and then i realized it just i can't beat it because i mean like i said i i I need to put a coat of varnish on several pieces. And if I don't do that, say at 10 o'clock at night, it means I can't work on them the next day. So having to schlep back and forth uh, just wasn't something that was going to really be, especially as I began to get, you know, increasingly more busy, it just wasn't something that was going to work. So I turned my garage. Yeah. Into it. So it's not, it's not a lovely space, but it's functional. So I, I don't know. I've been there. I think it's a cool space. Yeah, I love so it. It used to be a gym. Um, so hence, you know, I've got, Let's see if you can see here. So I've got these kind of uh, mirrors on the wall. And then I put some rubber matting down um, so i do not standing on concrete. Um, I do have a window and a shop vac. Um, so I, I typically will, you know, I do my work here. Um, maybe I can turn this around. That would make more sense, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> Way more sense. Oh, so, that's easier. <laughs> yeah. So I put a I put a bunch of shelving up. I've got my you know this thing this big workbench moves around. Um, I've got this really cool old filing cabinet. It's oh, weighs it's a million pounds, but that's <laughs> where I keep a lot of my stuff. And then I build all my old my, my own frames and panels. So that's my miter saw. Um, this little device here is where I do all the sanding. Unfortunately, I, I, I don't have it set up for my router and uh, table saw. So I have to sort of drag that outside when I want to rip wood and router my frames, which is a bit of a pain. But um, mm -hmm. this is where a lot of my wood 
usually resides, except I need to go and pick some more up. Um, bins for putting over top of pieces when I resin. So yeah, I, you know, um, I've got, you can't see, but I've got these screws in the wall everywhere. So I sort of will put pieces up as I'm working on them um, to get them out of the way. And, yeah. then I've got a, and then I've got a spare bedroom that just has a bunch of art sitting in it that's either going to a client or going to a gallery. So eventually I'd love to get a bigger space. I'd love to set up my woodworking equipment with like a permanent dust extraction system and not have to lug stuff outside and, you know, oh, this is, this is cool. This is called a track saw. So there's the track. Yeah. And see, I'm a guy. I like the tools, right? And, <laughs> yeah. I know. And I'm thinking, oh, I could get you to help me make a stretcher. <laughs> so this, that slides along the track. And that's how, oh, I, cool. cut, and that's how I cut the quarter inch Baltic birch that comes in five by five sheets to smaller pieces as I need. And I can get perfectly square pieces. Um, and then I miter, I miter the uh, pine here and mm -hmm. build. I mean, here's a small one. Right. So, you know, this is just an example of something small that I've built. Right. Um, yeah. Wow. So, there. so uh, it's, it's actually always interesting, I think, for people who aren't artists to recognize how the incredible amount of work that goes into creating a piece of art before you actually have to get to do the creative piece of it. It's, it's a, a lot. I mean, for me, I, so what I found is ordering panels um, became a little bit of a headache. So, um, yeah. I'm not the most organized person in the world. So when I have a client who says, I want a particular piece and I want it this size, you know, for me to order a panel, then go pick it up, could be anywhere from two to three weeks. So I just want to be able to build it and create it. And I can do that in a couple hours in the studio. Um, yeah. That way I also have complete oversight on the quality and build and control from start to finish, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. last thing I want is to have a client spend $3,000 on a piece of artwork and the panel separates from, you know, the, 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 the base or, or the frame cracks or whatever. So yeah. that way I just, I just know what I'm, I'm, I'm getting into and, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of particular with that stuff, so. Well, and yeah. especially now with COVID, I mean, that, you know, having all your, being so self-sufficient and in your own space where you can be safe and get everything done, it must be a real godsend. Because I know for me, uh, waiting for panels, it's about four weeks, sometimes five weeks, mm -hmm. which is a long time for a client to wait. But the other real challenge is then I get a whole bunch of stuff at once and all of a sudden, you go from being not so busy to ridiculously busy because yeah. you've got everything that clumps, you know? Yeah. So. And there's a bit yeah. of a cost. There's a bit of a cost savings too, but I mean, it's, it's not really about that because frankly, the amount of time it takes for me to pick up everything and build it, it's, it's, it's more just about the convenience of being able to do it when I want to do it. So. Now, do you find, do you find that act of um, like before you're doing the creative thinking, but kind of therapeutic in terms of it's a bit methodical, it's a bit exacting. It requires I enjoy your it. Yeah. concentration. Yeah. I yeah, think you'd have I, to, to put that much work yeah. into it. Yeah. Uh, last year, getting ready for the One of a Kind show, I decided I was going to build custom cabinetry for my booth and was really proud of how it worked out. Only to realize it looked beautiful. That about, only to realize that about this time, I was like, I don't have any product. And, <laughs> and I had but you'll have a kick-ass booth. <laughs> I had these amazing cabinets, but no product. So I, I, began to, I literally began to work 14 to 16 hour days up until the show, um, just trying to get ready. So anyways, um, yeah. so yeah, there's a little bit about my studio, a little bit about me. I used to be in sales. So I was the director of sales for a consumer electronics company. So I managed the entire retail channel for Canada. So that would be like Best Buy, Costco, Staples. And then I left and now I do this. Um, so Kate mentioned earlier that, you know, sort of the business of selling art. And I think you have to have a certain business acumen to be successful. Um, I think so too. And I think that you look at a lot of the artists who have been successful kind of professionally, um, yeah. a lot of them do have some sort of a corporate background because the reality is, is that it fosters, I think, the discipline to do all those things that are not so fun, right? The, yeah. the accounting and the paperwork and the following up when you'd really rather be in your studio, but you kind of yeah, I'm, still, I'm still terrible with that. That's maybe why I'm not in the corporate world anymore. But, but <laughs> yeah, me I, too. Just, yeah, I had my own <laughs> business. So I could do what I wanted. <laughs> no, nah, but I mean, you just figure it out, right? Um, yeah. So, 
yeah, I, I think I think I answered the questions you had for me. So yeah, so I work out of my my studio here, which is my garage. It's always a little bit odd when people are like, "Hey, can I come by your studio?" And I'm like, "It's not like I'm not running around in a beret, sipping red wine, listening to jazz, you know." <laughs> in, my cool, in my cool, I don't know. I've been to your studio. I'm pretty sure the red wine was part of that scenario. In my, in my cool, funky law studio, I'm like, yeah, yeah, and they pull out. Yeah. Like, this is a house, and I'm like, yeah, no, don't be worried. It's just, it's, it's just, you know, you know, come on, yeah. in, it's my garage. So, but like I said, it's functional. I mean, I've been out to places like Alton Mills. Would love to have a studio. Have you ever been there? Would love to have a studio. Oh, there. I right? actually. I'm here. Yeah, I'm back. Okay. Okay. But yeah, for me, my, my uh, studio was in my home and it was upstairs in my son's old bedroom. So it was like you had to go in the house and through the living room and upstairs. And it was getting to yeah. be a little bit um, too personal. So when I was looking at an external studio space, I looked at Alton Mills and I'm like, maybe I can make it work. And I'm like, Kate, there's no way you're going to drive an hour as beautiful as it is every day. Like you're never going to use it. Right. So having Art Alchemy so nice 10 though, minutes right? away is amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it is nice. Um, so, what, what else did what did you want to know? So, so I really, um, I really loved the fact that you really talked a lot. And I mean, in knowing you too, you're kind of a, you're a, I can see that you're a, an observer of human nature and people mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, and I'd kind of love to know a bit more about how you kind of take those observations and then integrate those into your work. How they find their way into your work. I, I mean, I think it's funny. I think, you know, you look like if I take a series that I have for example, masked the series with the ballerinas and people with masks and balloons. And, you know, you know, people sometimes ask you and, you know, did you come up with the concept and then create the art? Did you come up with the art and then the concept? And I think they both sort of evolved together. So it's like, I don't, I, mm -hmm. I don't know that I necessarily sat down and said, okay, here's a new series I'm going to work on. And this is the concept as much as you just begin to create. And then when you take a step back, maybe on a subconscious level, certain things are coming out because when you take a step back, yeah. you're like, oh, hey, I think this is kind of what, this makes sense. This is what's going on. And then- Yeah, and those work, you, pieces work together, which is a little bit different than the stuff I was working on a little bit earlier. Yeah, and all of a sudden, yeah. you know, and then, and then you already kind of have a story, but then you maybe you tailor it a little bit. So it was just a combination. That particular series for me came about um, as a result of me leaving my job, the corporate corporate world. So I'd been with the company for 12, 10 years, 12 years, 12 years. It was a really good job. Um, I'd been a director for the last couple of years and realized, because I pushed for that promotion, realized I didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> and frankly, I wasn't very, and, I, and I, wasn't, I wasn't very good at it. So it's like you could be a fantastic surgeon, but you might not be a great chief of staff. So I was, I was yeah. good. I, I think that's it. classic too. Like what makes a great salesperson yeah. doesn't necessarily make a great manager of salespeople. <laughs> so I was managing when I was a national sales manager and I had, I had staff in the field and I was sort of out problem solving, dealing with accounts, still at a head office level. Um, strategic enough that I would come in for particular meetings as they pertain to national accounts, but figured, you know, I'm going to push for this promotion because why not? Got mm -hmm. it. And it was just a lot of minutia. It was, I mean, I'm telling you, like I would go into Montreal every week. It would be like literally eight hour boardroom meetings. And I'm like, I just can't. But I, I hit a wall. And yeah. at that level, I was making a lot of money and, um, I, I was respected. I was liked. Um, I was maybe the fourth or fifth most senior person in the company, but I wasn't pulling my weight and I knew it. And I knew that the people that were at a similar senior level knew it, but nobody would say anything because, hey, it's Morgan. So we're not going to say. It. So I'd sit around these boardroom meetings and, at the end, and we'd hired some new people from Bombardier and they were really sort of enthusiastic and corporate culture was changing. I'm like, oh my God, I'm full of fun. Like I shouldn't be here like this. Like how long can I, it just was the most uncomfortable feeling until eventually I just spoke to the president who I knew quite well and my boss, the VP, and they agreed to package me out, which they did. Um, yeah. I think two years later I ended up, th then they created new offices and they wanted some new artwork. So they actually reached out to me and I had to create a proposal and I create, they're like, Hey, if anybody knows our corporate culture, it's you. So I created a whole series around their corporate culture, um, which is kind of where the mask started. 
And I'll never forget driving to Montreal to install like six or eight pieces and ripped up jeans and a t-shirt and walking by this boardroom where my old team was going through like a sales consensus meeting and just being like, oh my God, this is so, so, so bizarre. But I sort of, um, I really, but I really identify with you that because I worked in mutual fund industry as well. And yeah. so there's this real need to, especially being a creative in an analytic environment, you do wear a mask and you do sort of hide. And I remember, you know, you kind of, wear the power suits and the proper yeah. high heeled shoes, which I hate because I'm tall anyway, I never wear them. Um, and it was funny because uh, at some point we had, people came out afterwards after I sort of was, was an artist and people were like, wow, I never thought you were creative. I always thought you were a little bit like, you know, really stiff and uptight and professional. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, that's kind of scary because that's so not me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, on that, so, that's, so that's where the series evolved, right? It was the masks. Mm -hmm. It's kind of how I felt when I was leading this corporate life. So the masks yeah. in this particular series represent your social self. So that's kind of who we all pretend to be, right? And the balloons right, right. are who you truly are, um, which is who I was creatively, but not really being able to express myself. Um, they're supposed to work in tandem, right? There's a whole book on creative and essential self and how they work in tandem together. But I think as adults, we sometimes we, we lose touch with our essential self, like who we truly are inside. And we focus on yeah. what we wear, where we live, what we drive, who we hang out with, and that's the social self. Hence the floating balloon and the disconnect. And then the squiggles you see in a lot of my pieces are the, all the self-talk, all the reasons we tell ourselves why we can't be or do or, 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 or live the life that we truly believe that maybe we should be living. Um, mm -hmm. And I like ballerinas because I can place them in juxtaposition to their environment. So where they don't belong, which is kind of how I felt in the corporate world. And then frequently, um, in a lot of my pieces, there's always like an element of hope. So they're, they're, they're leaving or they're staring out a window with sunshine coming in. I might put in a hummingbird, which represents um, uh, prosperity and hope about to, unfill in your life, uh, about to unfold in your life. So I put in little sort of a lot of, sub you know, like, like symbolism and yeah, yeah I think yeah. but I think the other thing that works so beautifully with the ballerinas too is that just aesthetically they're just they're so graceful and they're so beautiful and they yeah. seem so connected to kind of I don't know nature or something that's a little bit otherworldly yeah yeah so I mean so that's kind of how that series involved and um and then for me I was I always had these this creative imagination I'd, I'd had these really cool ideas but I lacked the technical ability to execute. So I can paint, I'm an okay painter, um, but I, I didn't have the technical ability to be able to recreate these ideas in my head, which was really frustrating to me. I'm good with my hands, so I could build, I could make the masks that you see in a lot of these pieces. I could build props, I, I, so, so I was good, but I just couldn't execute. And then I discovered photography and I began to play around with photography. I took some classes at Ryerson. Um, I took some mixed media courses, some resin courses, and I began to realize that I can create. It doesn't just have to be a picture of a sunset or a bird on a, you know, I mean, that's just that's photography. And I leave that to photographers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't pretend to be a, an overly accomplished photographer. I'm an adequate photographer, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm able to create these kind of whimsical pieces that I wasn't able to paint, but I can now create with photography. And then through, through building props or the masks or the panels, um, I learned that I could incorporate various mixed media elements, right? Layer and gel mediums and varnish and metallic leaf and collage. And it takes on this kind of middle ground between photography and it's got a painterly feel so and, and that's what I sort of like about the pieces yeah that I do. well that's what I like about your pieces too like I find that you can you can keep seeing stuff in them like you sort of you, you see the first visual of say ballerinas on the TTC but then the more you look at it the more you see these elements and so I see these little tiny um the symbolism that kind of comes through and I always yeah. like a piece that the more you live with it the more you can see out of it the more you see out of it, yeah. And I mean, yeah. in some pieces, like this piece behind me, uh, uh, this is straight photography, right? Where I've, I've played around with it a little in Photoshop. That's something I've just mounted to board and I'll resin. Um, uh -huh. Whereas a lot of my other pieces, like this series, whoops, um, I'm getting away from the resin and I will layer in, you know, various mix. That's actually going to the ballerina that, that has helped me out in a number of shoots that I've done. So I'm in the middle of creating that oh, for So nice. Yeah. And so do you, do you think, very... do you think that, do you think that having that transition between kind of 
getting a job that you thought was your dream job and then kind of realizing it wasn't really for you and which is always I think a bit of a shock when you've sort of been driving for something and then you realize oh wow what I've been striving for isn't what I want do you kind of feel like you're just wearing a different mask now or are you kind of feeling sometimes. pretty comfortable with not wearing a mask I mean everybody of course wears a mask that's kind of the reality of life but yeah I mean sometimes. maybe a thinner mask <laughs> Sometimes we all wear masks, right? I mean, yeah. um, for, for a number of you, so, you know, people are always like, wow, you left your corporate job to, to you left your corporate job to, to become an artist. That's really great. And I'm like, no, it wasn't like that. Like, I just left because I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't really know what I was going to do. I thought I'd get back yeah. into sales for, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a liquor company or, or like Spin Master, which is based out of Toronto, which is a toy company. I just thought, I, I, you know, I'll just do something different and more interesting. And the art was something that I continued to do to keep busy. And then it just kind of evolved. But for a long time, if you had said, Morgan, what do you do? It would have been a long, convoluted answer. <laughs> because, if, you know, I, I wouldn't have said I'm an artist. Because at what point do you feel confident enough to say I'm an artist? I, anybody could say I'm an artist. Anybody could say I'm an actor. Right? Have you acted? Yeah, I've done one commercial, so I'm an actor. Yeah, but don't you think? I don't know. I think that anybody can say they're an artist, but I found, I found even for me, after when I was working, I was doing stuff like the Artist Project. I still was really when people asked me what I, I was like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I run a marketing firm. Like I felt like saying I was an artist was, I don't know. It just felt really felt weird. Well, I felt yeah, like it felt fraud. weird, and I felt like I was a little yeah, still a little bit of a fraud, and hadn't really figured out what I was doing, and you so know, so it seemed. Artist? Yeah, what makes an artist an artist? Do, you, do yeah. you have to sell your work to be an artist? No, I don't think that's right. Do you have to create work that people like to be? I think, I think it's if if you feel that you're an artist, then you're an artist. Right? I think yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a way that are you comfortable in your skin and are you comfortable in your art? And not to say that it's not always progressing. You're always moving forward with your art, but there's something about it. It's like it's a part of me now, and so therefore I identify that way. Yeah, so I, for, for a long time for me, I felt like I was a bit of a fraud. And, and that was on me. Was, I mean, if there's, there's, no, there's no rule book out there that says, here's the five criteria you need to be able to say you're an artist. It's different. If I want to say I'm a, I work in sales in, in sales management, well, there's some criteria. I have to have a job to be able to say that. Usually, yeah. I have to be employed by a company. But to say you're an artist, what is it? What makes you, you know, so for me, it was, it was a little more difficult and took a little longer to own that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, eventually, and, and this is more in line with who I am. It's more, I find it much, much more rewarding. Um, but there's plenty of things I miss about my old life, right? Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, well, I find especially and, now, because, you know, I, I was, uh, so I, Microsoft was our client and I had an amazing, like there's amazing people. They're super smart. I really enjoyed that intellectual challenge of learning new stuff all the time. Um, and I did also miss the, the culture and the atmosphere of, a, of an office. Like I only went in one day a week, right? But you kind of still go in, you see people and you something. catch up. Yeah. yeah. Whereas having your own business all of a sudden working in your basement, it was kind of like, yes, a lot of the funds have been kind of sucked out of this job. <laughs> you know? it's, it's, it's tough, which is another reason why I'd love to work somewhere like Alton Mills, because there'd just be some casual interaction with other artists doing their thing. So it is hard. It is solitary, yeah. which, which is tough. This year, particularly hard, because um, none of us have shows. I mean, I look, I look forward to the one of yeah. my shows, because I would, I would reconnect with everybody. Um, and we're not doing Oh, totally. Anything. So I know my sister used to laugh at me when I did the artist project because she's like, okay, you spent the first hour and a half going and socializing. At some point, you got to actually get your booth set up. Well, yeah, I mean that's that's yeah. So that was always enjoyable, but um, yeah. So so there's that. You so had... you talk a lot about. Oh, sorry. So no, you go, go ahead. No. <laughs> no, I was going to say I wanted to talk about because your work seems to me as an as an outside observer um, pretty methodical, like in terms of the process that you go through to to do it, and maybe that's watching the videos. But on your website, you talk a lot about kind of trial and error being kind of the best teacher. Yeah. Can you talk about how that how I that think fits? trial and error for me played, and I, I'm guilty of this. So trial and error played a much larger role initially. So if I look at some of my really early work, I'm like, oh, my God, wow. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I would try something, it didn't work out, and you learn. I, um, you mean, I, I mean, I think, I don't know how I... I was, I, I used to, to sand um, all around the image. So for example, I would take an image like that 
and I would lightly sand everything, maybe but the ballerina and the fox, and I would stain the whole thing, and it would give it this kind of really um, vintage sort of look and feel, but I don't do that anymore because it just I just don't think it works as well. But in doing that, I realized I could bevel the edges. Um, right, I, oh, there we go. hold on a second. Where is it? Why can't I do that? Oh, there we go. So I could bevel the edges um, and give them that sort of, you know, so that was a trial and error. I mean, it was it was kind of working with my stuff one way and then figuring something else that I think worked and incorporating that into new bodies of work. Um, I'm gui what I'm guilty of now is, you're right, I have a formula that I use. So I create, I mean, I might, I might do more trial and error out in the field when I'm taking some photographs. I was out scouting a new location yesterday for another big corporate piece I have to do. Took some shots of some old vintage Victorian furniture in the fall foliage and stuff. So that's trial and error, but the once I have the image done, the building the panel, applying it to the panel, adding the mixed media, I mean, that's kind of formulaic at this point. Yeah, and which makes sense, which makes sense because you've figured out the kinks and that's efficient. And then you, you sort of have, you build, you keep increasing your foundation, right? And then you can have trial and error on top of that, right? Yeah, As you perfect. I, I think one of my favorite things though to happen is when you've got a piece and you, you mess something up and you're like, oh, and the piece, literally, you're looking at it, and you're like, well, it's ruined. I mean, I, I yeah. can't, it's, it's done. And at that <laughs> point, you have two options. You can literally toss the piece, or you're like, well, you know what? I've really got nothing to lose at this point, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to take some cheesecloth, and I'm going to glue it to this and create texture. And I find when that happens, that's where the magic happens, because usually nine times out of ten, when you, when you go that with nothing to lose, you're like, hey, like, I really like this. Now, you may not love that particular piece. But there's but something love, in it that you, you see. You love the yeah. concept, which you... you yeah. And so the issue for me is is when I get chugging along and it becomes formulaic in the studio, I mean, the, the, the photography aspect, aspect is still, you know, always evolving and, and, and I'm being creative. But sometimes I get caught up in the same stuff in the studio. So, I mean, I mean you know, I, I do want to look to incorporate new mediums to try new things. But, um, you know, it's hard, especially when you're working on a big piece. And it's like, you know, three feet by five feet. You know, the last thing you really want to do is say, I'm going to try, I'm going to try. I'm going to try this over here and mess it up. So, yeah. Well, it's up to, it's sometimes trial and error is, is forced on you. I was uh, I had this big painting. It was, you know, like four feet by five feet. And I was taking it to a client or, well, I was actually taking it home. And I tripped at the studio and I literally fell. The painting went face down. So it had all this gravel and stuff yeah, in it. So yeah, I had to yeah. pick it all out and all these scratches. And all of a sudden I'm like, okay, like I can't ditch the whole thing. And, you yeah. know, with my work on wood, you can't, I can't pull it back. So it's kind of like, I guess I'm going to have to sort of rework some of it. And it actually, yeah. in, in the end, I really like the shape better. Like it sort of, sometimes it really does push yeah. that yeah. boundary. Yeah, no, it helps. So, um, and so with corporate work, um, like I, I and I'm thinking this kind of actually ties in the, corporate work and the trial and error and the perseverance and the hard work. I saw you doing just a huge piece recently. Yeah. So the Live More is sort of a lifestyle rental condo. Uh, it's been around for a number of years. I think it's like a really high end building at Bay and I don't know, Richmond or, or, or I, I don't know, downtown. Anyways, they built two new ones, uh, High Park Live More. And there's two of them. And I was contacted by the design company who I've known for a few years, reached out to me to do a piece for each lobby um, right as you come in. And each piece is like six feet by six feet. So huge. And I'd never done a piece that large. I didn't even know how I was going to do a piece that large. Shooting the image. <laughs> shooting the image. I, I love that, though. I'm sure you said, yes, I'm sure I could do it. And then you're like, holy yeah. shit, now I've got to figure it out, right? <laughs> I quoted him a price. And um, I made sure that I, 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 I built in some buffer for, because I knew printing a certain size was going to be more expensive. I knew materials would be more expensive. I knew. So I built, I knew I was going to have to maybe source and rent some props. Um, so I, I said, sure, no problem. And then I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. I have no idea if I can even can do this. And the first building was <laughs> and the first building was launching in October, and I'm like, I really hope I don't mess this up. So, um, I was pretty sure I could build the panel, right? Um, I mean, I could have gotten somebody like day and night to build it, no problem. But 
the issue with that is getting it to your house studio. <laughs> well, they could have, but the issue was they would have delivered it. The issue for me was, okay, so now I have the panel. How do I mount the image? Because you can't print that big. Maybe you can print like a poster, but I knew that the largest size I could print was 60 inches by however long I wanted. So that sure. was an issue for me. They don't make printers. I can't, they don't make, I can't go get something printed six feet wide. Not right. on ink, not on ink press luster on archival stuff. With it's not not how I use it. So if I got it printed in three sections, I didn't want to be like wallpapering this huge dinosaur. So I thought I'm gonna to have to build the board myself. I sat down and it was literally like an architect. I was figuring out okay, so I'm gonna to have to build the board in three pieces, and then I'm gonna assemble it in the studio. If I build it in three pieces, um, I can mount three individual images separately. Which will be huh. easier to which will be easier to mount because mounting yeah. I have a special process I use, but mounting the images, big ones, is really hard to make sure that you get like a nice uh, bond, no bubbles, uh, straight, nothing. absolutely hard. But I mean, I'm I've, I've got a real I've I've really perfected it, and like I said, I, I I've built myself some tools that I use to be able to do that. But doing something on this scale, I I didn't know so. I knew I had to build it in three pieces. I could assemble it in the studio and I knew I had to then print three separate images, but I didn't want three uniform pieces because that would look odd. So I had to literally in my head think, what, what's the concept I want to go with? And I came up with this abandoned kind of tea party in the forest with old Victorian vintage furniture in High Park. Yeah. Um, I would add in the animals and Photoshop later. And it was going to have this real kind of whimsical feel and the client loved it. So I then had to go and scout a location, found the location. And then I had to think, how is this going to look when it's done? And shoot with that in mind so that, for example, I had a tree on this side. And I knew that one of my panels was going to be eight inches by 72 inches. Right. And that that seam I could hide in the tree trunk. I knew that the, hmm. other, seam, the other seam was gonna go along the bottom um, and where you were going to see the boards being joined because there's no way of getting around you see a small seam where the boards were joined on the front. I do a lot of pinstriping on my pieces. I just like it, it's feel for sort of aesthetic reasons. So I knew that I could, I could put in a little bit of wood fill, light sand, and then add the pinstripe. So you, you, you know, on the front, it's seamless. On the back, I just use heavy duty builder's glue, like PL and a bunch of screws and clamps. And yeah, I mean, it worked, it worked like a charm. So I was- I It looks beautiful. I, yeah, I was, I was really happy with it and I was really happy that it worked. So doing another one, which I now need to do, um, the next one for the, another, for the other building, this one's gonna be sort of like an abandoned dinner party it's not going to be as busy it's just going to be two chairs a table and it's going to be in the evening and i just found a location the other day so it's going to be i'm going to have lights strung up and a generator to power them and um it's going to be in the evening time so i think it's going to be it'll be a different feel but it'll be cool and um it'll be a lot easier for me to build this time because i know i now know sort of you know what i need to do and how to do yeah. it yeah well and now for the next 60 inch by 60 inch commission you'll be like sure yeah no problem yeah no i problem. can go larger <laughs> i mean i don't usually i don't yeah i mean i think the largest i had done up until that point might have been like a 60 inch by 50 inch kind of thing which which even that was you know mounting that felt sort of daunting but this 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 was this was huge yeah, yeah. it's it's but, kind of scary I, I was talking to a client yesterday and they have a wall that's nine and a half feet by about 23 feet right and she's like, you know, what do you think? One big picture? I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know how I would right. physically move it. Like the panels get physically heavy, like once they get yeah, to be, you know, a certain size, right? But in actual yeah. fact, I think a diptych or a triptych would look nicer in the space anyway. But yeah, yeah. it's kind of always interesting to work large. Yeah. And how do you, how do you, um, so how do you present your concepts? Like when, something like a, what made you think, yeah, I think an abandoned tea party in the middle of the woods would be perfect so, for a corporate office. So when I'm, when I'm looking at, um, well, okay, so so this was this is a residential building, and and you know they they gave me certain specifics. So like we love your work, the ballerinas with the masks, we find lovely, but maybe a little too creepy for uh, a mainstream. Really? Well, yeah, I mean this is they, I know, they, that's they, cool. 
they may they might not have used the words creepy, but you know, there's going to be young kids. It might be a little scary or intimidating. Um, you know, there's a certain foreboding in some of them. So we love them, but we don't. You know, they they, they like really neutral work for this sort of stuff. Yeah. Not that what I created was neutral, but um, they're they're quite particular about that. So uh, I, you know, as I'm as I'm on Instagram or Facebook or any time I'm on social media, if I see a picture that trigger something, I'll just take a screenshot. And then I have a folder just called inspiration and I just dump them into there. Eventually I might get around to categorizing them, but so I just start, I just flip through and I might see something that's like, oh, hey, like that's kind of cool. What if I did, was to do this and add this and maybe I could do that. So, you know, I, I sort of come up with two or three concepts. I send it to the client with images as, you know, like for example, like yeah, I've got a picture of two little kids on uh, like an abandoned railroad track sitting on suitcases in like old, old, like, I don't know, 1950s clothing, not my image. It's quite, it's well lit. It's really cool. So I might look at that and be like, Hey, um, you know, I'm going to do a ballerina on the railroad tracks with some old suitcases. Like she's waiting for, you know, like, so, so I, you know, I, that's kind of how these things evolve, right? At least mm -hmm. for me. Um, anytime I'm out, I might see something, I'll take a picture. I might see a location, I'll take a picture and, and geotag it so I know where it was. Um, sometimes I have a book that I write ideas in as they sort of come to me periodically. And, and sometimes I do nothing with them, sometimes I do. So. You know, well, sometimes, you have, sometimes you've done nothing with them yet, right? Like, I think that's yet, the, yeah. you know, it's, it's, I really enjoy commissions as well, partially for that same reason, is that you kind of, it pushes you sometimes to kind of think about how to integrate what the client is looking for in their space and what they yeah. actually are looking for without kind of obviously not compromising your own work, but kind of taking yeah. it into a different direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so that's that's kind of what that's kind of what happened there. And then um, this this piece that I created for the client got me thinking. Well, so I looked at you know where am I going to get this old Victorian furniture from, right? That I wanted to use, and you know I we're in Toronto, so I know there's lots of there's like the prop shop or the prop house, and there's plenty of places where uh, TV and the movie industry will go to for props. So I went to some of these places and they had kind of what I was looking for, but a lot of them were like, I don't know, to rent like an old chaise lounge was going to be, I don't know, $150 for four days. And I needed to rent it twice. I'm like, well, that's 300 bucks. And I need several pieces of furniture. Mm -hmm. I kind of budgeted some of this into the price of the artwork. So it wasn't a big deal, but I thought I started just looking on Facebook marketplace and Kijiji and I'm like, well, I could buy an old chair for 70 bucks and like a slipper chair or a Queen Anne chair. Um, and I don't really care if it's a bit scratched up or the, or the. It's kind of the, the point, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I ended up with all of this furniture. I got this one. This one's really cool. I got this one on auction. So now I have all this. Oh, don't mind the baseball bat. I don't know why I have that. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah. So now I have all this haunted furniture in my house. Where I don't. know. Oh, that's cool. Is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, most of it's up in my spare bedroom. Um, and now that I've got it, I'm like, well, what can they do with it? So I'm, it, it actually got me thinking about starting a new series. So now I'm going to do a spinoff of this piece that I did for the client, where I'm going to just put a couple pieces in the woods different settings. Um, maybe sometimes I'll do ballerinas. Sometimes I'll just do some animals. Uh, Blue Crow sold one. Blue, I just made one and Blue Crow sold it, I think, in, within, you know. So, I mean, I, I, I'll make a couple pieces. I took one to Arta Gallery, one to Blue Crow. I'm like, let me know what clients say. Let me know what sort of feedback. The one at Blue Crow sold. Well, I don't think the one at Arta Gallery has yet. But so that's like, well, hey, okay, so I'm on to something. I'm going to start playing around with that concept now. So, yeah. you know. Um, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Well, that's so, the thing with that, so, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the fun thing. You can keep going. That's why I said well, you haven't, you're not going to do anything with those ideas. You just haven't done anything with them yet, right? There's probably still percolating and might but come you up. Ha you have to, right? Because eventually people are going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of over the ballerinas now. So, and if I wait for that to happen, then I'm going to be in trouble because I'm like, okay, well, 
I'm not selling anything anymore. What am I going to do? I come. <laughs> so I think it's all, you always have to keep pivoting and coming up with new ideas, trying new concepts. And I'm not done with the ballerina series yet or the mass series, but um, not by a long shot. But but uh, you're starting to introduce a new series to that audience to kind of pull your collectors it's along. Yeah, it's fun, and I enjoy yeah. that. Um, I enjoy that. So, so, you know, do, you know, doing this piece, you know, some of the, some of the most interesting things I've done are when a client, like I do, I've done some weird family portraits for clients where, you know, family portraits, I think are kind of lame. Like who wants like a big photo of their family over the fireplace. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> in matching sweater. so I'll do something really quirky and weird with masks and all this sort of stuff. And despite the fact that people are wearing masks, you, you, you still, you, I don't know, there's a sense to the piece where you still know who it is. You still know what's your family. And, and now it becomes a piece of art. So I've done some large pieces and those are challenging because you're working with kids, typical kids, and you got to sort of create or ca capture the personality a little bit. But those pieces, I always get nervous about shooting and doing. And that's when I really enjoy what I do because you're really sort of stretching yourself and, and challenging yourself. Yeah, you pushing know? the boundaries. Yeah, which I like. Cool. So the other thing I want to talk to you about, because it's, uh, I know you don't really incorporate them so much into your larger pieces, but where your small ones are your little gnomes the little that you're gnomes? Probably, probably best known for, I would think, just in terms of yeah. general. There's, there's so, and I, I, have, I have a personal affinity for gnomes because my uh, grandfather was a huge gardener in England. And so they yeah. had gnomes in the garden. And I remember my job as a kid would go and repaint them yeah. <laughs> every time I visited, which was every four years. So yeah. what's the history of those and what's the life? Tell me about the lifestyle of the gnomes. <laughs> Well, so my sister gave me a little housewarming gnome years ago, um, just a small, it was just like, a, it was from Italy, it was really cool, small little guy. And uh, I had a book as a kid too, um, like a field guide to gnomes, I, it's, it's quite well known, it's re it was really, really well done and really cool. Um, and she gave me this, she gave me two of them, this little housewarming gnome, and at the time, this is about 10, 10, 10 years ago now, at the time I was taking a photography course at Ryerson. And we had to do a depth of field study. So I was cruising around the house uh, or outside taking, uh, I'm going to show you. I was taking uh, various photographs, putting the gnome in different places and doing depth of field. Um, and I just kind of liked it. And then I think one of the images, I'm going to show you, one of the images I did, um, I remember I, I was playing around with Photoshop. I was just learning Photoshop. And I added a little Starbucks emblem. So... <laughs> I think that guy is the first gnome. So oh, he's great. <laughs> if you see, whoops. So if you see, um, see how he's kind of sanded? I said I used to sand around. Yeah. yeah. So he's kind of got that vintage. So that's one of the first gnomes. So, um, but it totally still looks like a Morgan Jones, even like 10 years ago, which is amazing. Yeah. So I, um, and, oh, yeah. Here, meet Figgy. There's Figgy. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, so I, I started playing around. I was taking this resin course at the same time. And I, I think it was around Christmas. I was at Walnut Studios. And I thought, well, I'm just going to mount a couple of these little guys to blocks and play around with them. And I did that. And people liked them. So then I started taking a few more pictures. Walnut Studios, we'd have these open houses where we'd get people that would come through twice a year. It was like a big party. It was kind of cool. And I'd sell these little blocks and people loved them. Um, so I started playing around with more gnomes. I started searching the internet for different gnomes. Um, it's tough to find a good gnome that I can photograph. Harder than you think. Um, no, I know because I think a lot of them are plastic. And one of the ones I loved with my grandparents is they were, I don't know, they were porcelain or ceramic or concrete or something. Like they were they have a different feeling to them. Yeah. So there's one there. Um, he came holding a lantern, but I use him because he's good for a balloon or whatever often. I don't photograph yeah. him from the front because I just find that they look a little, they Freaky? just don't look, <laughs> well, they just don't, they don't have the same whimsical quality. They just, one or two, there's only one or two that I'll photograph from the front. Um, most of them I'll photograph from behind. They just, it just looks better. Um, and, uh, yeah, see there's the gnome I just showed you. There he is there holding a balloon. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just started finding different gnomes and coming up with different ideas and, um, and photographing them. I mean, the early ones look quite a bit different than, you know, they do now. Uh, 
I remember I sold a bunch through Spruce and & Co. and Parliament, and they were very different, and they've really kind of evolved. And I ended up moving to an 8 by 8 size, I think, for the, the very first one of a kind show I did, which is was in 2015. And now what I do is I number each block with the latitude and longitude where the photo was taken. Hmm. Um, so they all have, it's really subtle, but they all have the numbers or the latitude and longitude where the photo was taken. And then I periodically discontinue them. So I'll make a certain, you know, this one, I think I just started. This one I started, this one was new last year. So I'll probably make it for another year. Um, and then I'll, I'll discontinue it, right? Um, so I discontinue them periodically and introduce new ones. Um, I think the next one I want to try and shoot, and I, I, I need to get out while there's still leaves, is I, I've been collecting garbage. Nice garbage. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to take a I want to take a garbage bin down to the beaches where there's all these leaves and trees. I'm going to turn it on its side, and I'm going to have the garbage bag spilling out. And I'm going to have a gnome with a lantern, and I'm going to add a raccoon after the fact. So it's what I've been meaning to do for a while. So I think uh, I think that'll be the next one I do. Um, I like to try and not photo. So I always don't if I can avoid photoshopping things in, I will. Um, the piece I just showed you with the penguin, that was a taxidermy penguin that I used, so it worked really well. Oh, most cool. <laughs> yeah, so most of the taxidermy raccoons look really scary and not nice, like skinny and just, yeah. So I, I can't use one of those because I haven't found a good one. So the raccoon will probably have to Photoshop in. Yeah. Um, but if I can use, re I mean, I've done some in Ireland where they're, the sheep are actually there. I just plop the gnome down and waited for a sheep to wander by. And so if I could do that, I'd prefer to do that. So you, you pack your gnome in your travel luggage, I guess, do you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and do you ever get caught by border security going, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's Sheldon. Yeah, yeah. I just saw a message from one of my yeah. clients. Yeah. Um, hey, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm always looking to, to shoot. new, And I think I might even tie in this new series I want to do with furniture in the forest. I might, because it's random, I might. I might add in a gnome here or there. A lot of people will come up with ideas for me, but 95% of the time I can't use them because they're like, oh, you should do a gnome in front of like City Hall. And I'm like, yeah, but you forget that I got to be at gnome level when I shoot the picture and it's an eight by eight block. So unless yeah. you want the gnome to be this big so you can see, so the picture doesn't, most of these ideas just, they don't work because I know you know, like I'm lying on my stomach and where the gnome's got to go. So it's, 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 you know, but they come to me when they come to me. Yeah. yeah well, I think that's it. I mean, I, I, you can absorb different people's ideas, but ultimately it has to gel for you as an artist for you to get excited about it too. Right. Yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. So, and so your next gnomes are going to be, I, I know you're doing um, one of a kind, your store will be open like what this weekend, right? Yeah. I, I don't really know. I know, because I was going to say, I'm doing one of a kind, too, which I'm, apparently my store is being integrated sometime today, so. <laughs> yeah, so I don't think mine's integrated yet. Um, I know Digital Main Street's helping me, and I just saw a message pop up while we were chatting saying, you need to contact one of a kind. I'm like, okay, so. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, last year I was stressed out, running around, getting ready for the one of a kind show. This year, the actual show's not happening, but somehow I'm still stressed out running around. Oh, running it's way more stressful. I I'm yeah. never... I'm never complaining if I have to go and slap, put nails on a wall and no. stick paintings on the, on the wall anymore. That's way easier. No, 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 no. no. Although last year, I, I, last year um, was, yeah. To make yeah. matters worse, I, I painted a feature wall last year. And, you know, it's one of those things where I painted my feature wall and I looked down at a bucket of paint. And I said, I should really move that bucket of paint because I'm going to knock it over. And I thought, no, I won't knock it over. And then 10 minutes later, I knocked it over. Morgan, you've got to trust your instincts. You know yeah. that. And then try to get somebody to clean up spill paint at the inner care center like people walking around with their vests i'm thinking these people work here but i don't no. know what they do they definitely didn't want to clean up my paint and I, yeah so that was that was a nightmare i remember trying to clean that up like 15 minutes before we had to be out of the building and uh it involved the mop and toilet water and it was not nice it was just a disaster. <laughs> Well, not, yeah, last year I had uh, a different size than I was expecting, so I had to revamp everything, I remember, yeah. last minute, too. So anyway, believe it or not, because you were concerned we weren't going to be able to talk for an hour, we have about three minutes yeah. left. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask you my uh, Kate's quickies. So Kate's one quickies, piece of advice right. for your younger self. 
One piece of adv- um, one piece of oh one piece of advice for my younger self would have been um, hindsight being twenty twenty. I, I would have ramped up rather than leaving my job like I did and floundering and somehow finding my way and making a career out of doing this. I would have started to ramp up. I would have done one show, two shows a year, still worked my corporate life, and then gradually sort of tailored that down. So you can finance the the beginning of your art career, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I think that's I, a good I, idea. I yeah, I blew through some savings for sure, financing the beginning of my art career. And had I have just kind of because at that point it's like if I know I'm doing this, well then if I'm kind of only half present at work, that's fine. <laughs> In fact, it's maybe good, <laughs> right? Because but yeah. I, I would have, I would have ramped up slower for sure. Yeah, that's that's what I did. Is I ramped up for a couple of years, yeah. but it did. It also causes its own set of issues. Like my business partner is like, you know what? I just can't have you going for like five days and doing the artist project. Like I need yeah, you in the yeah, office. Yeah. So, yeah. but I think you're right. Um, okay, so um, what do you think about if you're driving in a car all alone? Uh, girls mostly. <laughs> No, I don't. I think about all sorts of things. Um, I think about, I mean, I, I, it depends, right? It depends what's going on in my life at the time. But I really like driving. Um, I'll listen to music. You know what I do? I do get busy. I'm not good at phone calls. I'm not good at, at I'm a little bit like out of sight, out of mind. So I often use the time to call friends and just chat. You know, my parents are in Godridge, so they're three hours away. So I do make that drive quite often. And I'll chat. I'll think. I'm also always have my my camera in the back. So if I see, um, I'll, I'll be looking. If I see something really cool, I'll just pull over and maybe take some pictures. Mm-hmm. Good idea. Okay, last question. Uh, what's your big hairy ass goal? Doesn't have to be really realistic. What would it be? Um, I have been talking about wanting to get out of Toronto now for a couple of years. So I've got a place in Leslieville. I've had it for 10 years. So I would love to... I'd love to sell it, buy something outside of the city, um, and build myself like a nice studio out back. Something that I could just, I'm just, I'm, I'm happy to walk into. It's got like big barn doors I could open up when the weather's nice. I've got like my, my woodworking section with my dust extraction. And it's just like the perfect, you know, the kind of studio that you just want totally. to be in. Oh. And you just want to, yeah. you don't even want to leave it. You got, you know. Like, yeah. um, I think it's Blue Smith. He's an artist out of, I think, I think he's out of Victoria. And he occasionally sh- takes pictures of his studio. And I'm like, oh my God, this studio is bigger than my whole house. Like, it looks yeah, so gorgeous. Lots of windows. Yeah, I'm so jealous. Yeah, that'd be, that, that'd be yeah. That'd okay. Be awesome. And I'm, I'm going to have to cut you off because otherwise I'm not going to have time to be able to actually record this. But thank you so okay, much. Sorry. I really appreciate it. Thanks, and uh, we'll see you online at the One of a Kind. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Next week we have for episode 23, we've got Eleanor Loudon and uh, this will be posted on my uh, YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Kate Taylor art and on my Facebook. And so we will talk to you later. Have a great day and I will see you next week.